Have you ever had a friend turn on you, just completely just stab you in the back? Yeah, we all have, but nothing like this guy had. The victim was 32-year-old music teacher Gary Hinman, who was tortured before being murdered by Manson and Robert Beausoleil back in 1969. Are you in agreement, agreement with the uh, uh, verdict? Yes, I'm in agreement with the verdict. I think it comports with justice. As I indicated before, I'm always sad to see a death penalty verdict returned. And I, my heart goes out to the parents, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Beausoleil. Robert Beausoleil is an American murderer and an associate of Charles Manson and a member of the Manson family. He was charged with the fatal stabbing of Gary Hinman and didn't seem regretful at all. During his imprisonment, Beausoleil has recorded and released music. He has also worked on visual art, instrument design, and media technology. Robert Beausoleil, nicknamed Bobby, was born on November 6, 1947, in Santa Barbara, California, to a large working class family, to parents Charles Kenneth Beausoleil and Helen Arlen Mattox. His father worked as a milkman for 20 years for a dairy company before being promoted to a manager position. Bobby was the first born in a Catholic family and has four siblings. When he was 15, Bobby was sent to Los Pretos Boys Camp for 10 months for running away from home and a series of juvenile pranks. The camp is a 17 acres facility in Los Padres National Forest, which offers a program to return the youth to the community as responsible and productive members. After he was released, Bobby moved to Los Angeles and drifted between there and San Francisco, gravitating toward the emerging counterculture music scene and acting. He became a member of several rock bands beginning in 1965, including the Orchestra, the Milky Way, and the Grassroots, which later became Love. In 1967, he met Kenneth Anger and secured a part in Anger's film Lucifer Rising, but little footage was shot before the two had a falling out and the project was abandoned. However, later Bobby with his prison band, the Freedom Orchestra, completed the soundtrack for Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising in 1979. The film premiered in New York in 1980. Bobby, at the age of 16, had a brief appearance as Cupid, shooting an arrow from his bow in the 1967 film Mondo Hollywood, a documentary about the social, political, and cultural climate of Los Angeles. It included a wide cast of Hollywood figures, including Manson family murder victim Jace Brink. Well, I think so too. I mean, Bobby is very talented. It's too bad that he didn't get In 1968, Bobby was living with Gary Hillman in Tupanaga Canyon when he met Charles Manson and became a member of the family. In 1982, while in prison, Bobby got married to Barbara and she was instrumental in keeping him contacted with, it, with the world until she died from a sudden illness in 2012. The website she established on her husband's behalf is now maintained and kept up to date by close friends and family. Nearly all of Bobby's creative works can be streamed and viewed at bobbybosley.com. I was tired and I come home and who's in my house but Bobby Boussley sitting on the floor. And you know, it was okay because, you know, we were friends. I hadn't seen him in a long time. So I said, Bob, how are you doing? And, you know, we tripped. And then I noticed the door to my bedroom was closed. Is so somebody in my room? He said, oh, yeah, I brought my chick with me, man. So, okay, if she crashes for a while. I said, sure, man. And, and then uh, after we're talking, you know, this scroungy-looking thing comes walking out of my bedroom. And I said, he said, this is Sadie Glutt. She's a black-haired chick, real skinny, and cadavers look like she was walking dead. And, you know, I'm kind of bummed out now that I said this chick that looks as though she hasn't bathed in years, she's in my bed, and um, so I you know, made it known to him that I was very happy about that, and uh, he started talking to me about um, this group that he was living with up in um, some, uh, some ranch they were living, and uh, it turned out to be that Manson character that he was talking about, and the lady Sadie Glutz, the skinny, was Susan Atkins, I later find out. Um, he wanted to get away from these people. He was kind of frightened and, and talking to me in kind of hushed tones and saying um, that he didn't want, uh, Charlie didn't know that he was, you know, had stopped by a friend's house and all of that and that 
Sadie would probably tell him and he'd get him in trouble. I said, get you in trouble? What the hell, man? Is this guy your father? And he said, no, he's not my dad. It's nothing like that, but um, I'd just rather him not know. And I said, man, you should get away from those people. If it's like that, you should get the hell away now. And if he'd taken my advice, you know, the dream wouldn't have died the way it did in that awful, awful, you know, cataclysm that happened with those people. So I, you know, think a lot of times that if somebody had just found a gig for him, you know, in a group, then that whole thing probably wouldn't have happened because Bobby was the guy that brought all of the other people into that group and introduced him to these people because he was the kind of person that knew everybody. And um, anyway, it's, it's a sad business, this whole thing. But um, as far as having anything to do with the group, he was just on the periphery, you know, so. On the night of July 25, 1969, Bobby went with Atkins and Brunner to Hinman's house and demanded that Hinman give them money. Prosecutors said it had been rumored that Hinman had received a $20,000 inheritance. Hinman said that he did not have the money. Then Bobby called Manson at Span Ranch. Manson told them to hold Hinman captive in his house and convince him to get the money before Manson arrived. Manson later denied giving any orders to the family members. Bruce Davis drove Manson to the house. When Manson arrived, he took a samurai sword and struck Hinman, severely cutting his face and ear. Then Manson and Davis left, while Bobby stitched up Hinman's ear and face with dental floss. Other reports say that the stitching was done by Atkins and Brunner. Hinman begged for medical attention, but he was held captive at the house and tortured for three days. Then Bobby stabbed him two times in the chest. Then while Hinman was dying, Bobby Atkins and Brunner took turns smothering him with a pillow. After killing Hinman, Bobby wrote the word political piggy on the wall with Hinman's blood in an attempt to lead police to believe the murder was done by a radical group. He dipped his hands in Hinman's blood and left a paw print, attempting to symbolize the Black Panther as another way to mislead investigators and invoke the race war Manson called Helter Skelter. Charles Manson believed Gary had come into an inheritance and wanted the money. In July 1969, Manson disciple Robert Beausoleil brutally stabbed Gary to death. The words political piggy were scrawled on the wall in Gary's blood. It was such a horrendous murder. He was tortured. Beausoleil drove away in Hinman's Fiat and was arrested on August 6, 1969 after falling asleep in the car, having pulled off the highway at a step segment of US Route 101 San Luis Obispo. It was through Bobby Beausoleil that Manson became aware of Gary Hinman, who was tortured and killed by the family over three days in July 1969. Beausoleil, who had been the one to finally kill Hinman, was caught just over a week later and convicted of murder. As of 2021, he is still incarcerated and is today well known for the art and music he has produced in prison. In a jailhouse interview 12 years after the murder, Bosulay asserted that the killing was the result of a drug transaction gone wrong. According to his 1981 interview published in Wii magazine, Bosulay first said he had unknowingly supplied members of the straight Satan motorcycle gang with a batch of bad masculine sold to him by Hinman, and the bikers had demanded their money back. In that interview, he denied that Manson had came to Hinman's residence. Bobby said that he had cut Hinman's face himself with a knife during a struggle over a gun. You know, I did get caught up in, in circumstances that um, resulted in me forfeiting a lot of uh, a lot of things in my life. And um, I'm not alone in that. I mean, there are some people that, in fact, everyone that was involved with him um, was be really, I think, betrayed. Um, I mean, he, he had the trust of the people that were with him, and uh, I think he betrayed that trust. Sure. And that's really a, a tragedy. I mean, the, the killings themselves were a tragedy. Um, and, uh, you know, they were horrendous events. Um, sure. Uh, just, you know, the... Uh, I don't know, you know, everything, there's, there's so many different ways of looking at this. I mean, there is a, Charlie's personal rage uh, was expressed through the people that were with him. Um, I don't know, you know, my, uh, you know, the crime that I, I committed, the, the killing of Gary Hammond that brought me to prison, um, 
that this is an event that occurred before, you know, the day might be under the main, you know, events that everybody knows about. And I was in jail at the time this thing happened. And the motivations and whatnot were completely different as far as I could tell. You know, I mean, I know I wasn't there uh, to kill Gary Hinman to start Helter Skelter or to start a race war or any of this other kind of stuff that was supposedly going on with these other killings. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a personal thing, it was uh, related to Conspirator Susan Atkins stated before her death that she never heard Bobby indicate that a drug transaction was related at all to why they went to Hinman's house seeking money from him. On the uh, 31st of uh, July, Paul and I uh, came out here at the request of our Malibu station and uh, the body was found in the home by friends of uh, Gary. And uh, after we entered the home, we uh, saw signs of a struggle and it appeared as though there had been a some degree of violence. He was found in the living room directly up here and uh, he was lying on his back with multiple stab wounds. He had been dead approximately one week, one week at the time that he was found. Had he also been shot or were there any signs of gunshots here at all? Yes, there was. He had not been shot. Uh, however, there is signs that there was a, a gun fired in the house. Gary uh, sold some dope to some bad people. He sold some drugs that cost uh, uh, Bosley's wife to lose her baby. Kid come to me and says, Hinman owes me. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, you're my brother, right? I said, yeah, that's right. He said, what do I do? I said, well, if you're big enough, go get your money. If you're not, sit down and keep quiet. He said, what would you do? I said, it's money, man, it's not worth the trouble. You dig? Let's go party, you know? I mean, what do we need money for? All right, I'm big enough. I'm gonna go get it. I said, okay, if that's what you want. So he called me a couple of days later, he said, man, this guy's got a gun. I said, don't invoke me to no violence, man. I just got out of the penitentiary, I don't want to go back. He, did. he said, you said you were my brother. <laughs> and, and he said, what do I do? He's got a gun. I said, well, if he's got a gun, he's a coward. He must be afraid or he wouldn't have a gun, you know. I said, you don't need a gun, man. I said, uh, don't reach for the gun. If you reach for the gun, he'll shoot you. Because you're putting his mind on the gun. Smack him in the mouth first. Put his mind on his mouth, then grab the gun. Oh, you're crazy. I said, no, that's not crazy. It's just a matter of dealing with yourself. Show me. So I said, don't, you know, so I got involved. So here I go. Bruce McGregor Davis and I go over to Hinman's house. I got a knife on my leg. So I cut Hinman's ear and I take the gun. He shoots off on the wall and I throw the gun one way and I throw the knife the other way, and I give the kid the, the knife, and I say, that's how you do it. Don't bring me into none of this no more. Don't bring me into no violence. Then I'm thinking, I gotta scare this character. I say, all right, now I got to kill you, Henry. He said, oh, don't kill me. I said, if I don't kill you, you're gonna tell my parole officer, and he's gonna put me back in prison. He said, no, I won't, I won't tell. I said, you give me your word as your bond, and your bond as your life, you won't tell. He said, I give you my word as my bond, and I, and I look back at the Frenchman, and I, the Frenchman's standing there with a the knife. He's got Henman. Are we in the truth here? And he said, yes, we're in the truth. I said, okay. We passed his ear up. We put some scotch tape on his ear. We fixed him up. He's back on the road. No problems. I'm out of there, man. I straightened it out. I got paid. I said, pay the kid what you owe him. He paid him the money. Uh, they transferred the cars and made their deals. So then Henman got well, he got the knife, oh no, he got the gun. From, he got the gun, he said, I'm gonna go kill that, so the little brother. And he said, well, and Bobby said, no, I can't let you do that. He said, you gave your word. And he said, well, no, that don't mean nothing to me. You know, he said, he cut my ear, I'm gonna go blah, blah, blah. And Bobby said, no, I can't let you do that because he was standing up for me. Henman says, uh, he pushed by, he pushed by Bobby and Bobby handed him the knife. And he says, I'll not let you harm him because he was standing in my place and he's my brother. On April 18, 1970, a Superior Court jury in Los Angeles found the 22-year-old Bobby guilty of first-degree murder of Hinman and sentenced him to death. During the trial, Bobby's 18-year-old girlfriend, Katie, had testified against him. She was then pregnant by him and later gave birth to a daughter who would be raised by her parents.
1972 following the Supreme Court of California ruling that the death penalty were unconstitutional in the case of People v. Anders, which made Bobby's sentence get commuted to life imprisonment. Bobby's initial parole suitability hearing was held on August 15, 1978. Until 2019, he had a total of 18 suitability hearings. Each time the parole board rejected his bid, while in prison, Bobby attracted some women admirers. In 1980, he married a 21-year-old fan, but within a year, she sought to revoke the marriage, saying he had also been involved with other women. On April 15, 1982, while incarcerated, Bobby was stabbed by other prisoners. After that point, he reportedly began to lose his sense of loyalty to Manson and distanced himself more from the family. He ceased to justify their actions and expressed more regret about what they done. In 2016, his parole bid was denied, in part because he was said to have been recording music for sale without permission from the California authorities. According to Gary Hinman's cousin Kay Hinman and Sharon Tate's sister Deborah Tate, they had been involved in the parole hearing and continued to oppose the release of Beausoleil. Kay stated, this man does not belong outside of the walls of prison. Deborah Tate repeated the allegation that Beausoleil had been violating prison rules by profiting from the sale of his music and art while in prison. He started a petition on change.org to ask the government to deny him parole. Bobby's attorney responded to the comment about the music and art activities by saying that everything he has produced so far was done with the full permission of the warden of his prior institution. For Deborah Tate, staying involved in the proceedings for other Manson family members is her mission. I have four other Manson family inmates that are coming up for parole in between now and the end of the year, and I will attend to those. I will fight and do what I do, and that's all I can do. Beausoleil was sentenced to life in prison, and Kay wants to make sure it stays that way. She travels from Denver to California, attending every hearing. Bobby Beausoleil said at the parole hearing this last one that he regretted the murder. No remorse. I didn't hear that. I heard the word regret, and that doesn't do it for me. To add insult, Beausoleil is allowed to sell his art and make music while in prison. Two of his songs are featured on the soundtrack to Lady Gaga's documentary, Five Foot Two. Why is he allowed to have run a business and be in prison? It's not fair. Gary's dead. Kay created this change.org petition, hoping to keep Beausoleil behind bars. The political system as it stands in California now has no way to stop it other than the governor. On the 3rd of January 2019, a panel of commissioners of the California Board of Parole recommended that Beausoleil be freed on parole. The panel cited Bobby's youthful offender status as having been mitigating factor in his crimes. They noted that during his nearly half century of an incarceration, he had pursued creative outlets and pro-social growth, gradually maturing into a person exhibiting compassion and empathy. The Los Angeles District Attorney's Office disagreed, saying that the panel's recommendation was unfortunate. As has been the case of several other Manson's associates, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, denied Bobby's parole recommendation on April 26, 2019, saying he felt that Bobby's release could still pose a danger to society. Beausoleil has lied and changed his story about how the murders happened. He's gotten involved in a lot of prison infractions. I don't think he'll ever get out. As of 2023, only two people who have been convicted of murder and the killing committed by the family have been released from prison. Stephen Grogan, who was paroled in 1985, and Leslie Van Houten, who was paroled in 2023. Several others, including Manson and Atkins, have died in prison. Bruce Davis remains in prison. In prison, he's developed a reputation as an innovator in music synthesizers. In a prison visiting room, Beausoleil demonstrated an instrument modeled after an electronic guitar synthesizer he built. He operates an electronic music business and produces electronic sounds that are stored in a device and sells them to companies like Casio. This is music he says he wrote and produced. I find more variety in the, in the palette of colors that are available in sound than I do in the palette of colors that are available on, a, on an artist easily. 
Bosile says he's ready for parole. Besides his music business, he's earned a high school diploma and degrees in electronics. His psychiatric reports are positive, but he fears his link to Manson has kept him in prison longer than otherwise would have been the case. My interest in Manson at the time was to try to get him in the studio because I thought he had talent. And I, I think he did have talent, but he just he threw it away. Beausoleil says he regrets the connection, but was never a Manson family member. He says now his dream is to be uh, successful, successful in life. In the sense that when I'm 90 years old, I can look back and say, hey, I really did something despite all, despite my failures. In an interview with Truman Capote in 1981, Bobby talked about the Tate murder that the family committed two days after he was arrested. During the interview, Truman Capote asked, You're not making much sense, at least to me, and I don't think you're stupid. Let's try again. In your opinion, it's all right that Manson sent Tex Watts and those girls into that house to slaughter total strangers, innocent people. Bobby responded, Who says they were innocent? They burned people on dope deals, Sharon Tate and that gang, and they picked up kids on the strip and took them home and wiped them made movie of it, ask the cops, they found the movies, not that they would tell you the truth. Truman The truth is, the Labianca and Sharon Tate and her friends were killed to protect you, their deaths were directly linked to the Gary in men's murder. Bobby I hear you, I hear where you're coming from. Truman those were all imitations of Hinman's murder to prove that you couldn't have killed Hinman and thereby get you out of jail. Bobby, to get me out of jail, he nods, then smiles. None of that came out at any of the trials. The girls got on the stand and tried to really tell how it all came down, but nobody would listen. People couldn't believe anything except what the media said. The media had them programmed to believe it all happened because we were out to start a race war, that it was mean, the n-word, going around hurting all those good white folk. Only, it was like you say, the media, they called us a family, and it was the only true thing they said, we were a family, we were mother, father, brother, sister, daughter, and son. If a member of our family was in jeopardy, we didn't abandon that person, and so for the love of a brother, a brother who was in jail, all of those killing came down. <laughs>